Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. And in this podcast, we interview thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce the environmental impact, uh, their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. With today's episode, we go back uh, to, to the topic that we hold dearest to our hearts, which is, of course, urban metabolism. Uh, and if you have ever explored the topic of urban metabolism, one of the first pieces of text that you will encounter is the article, The Changing Metabolism of Cities, uh, which quantified the energy, materials, water, and waste flows from eight different cities, which was co-authored by Chris Kennedy. In fact, Chris has been one of the main driving forces of the renaissance of the urban metabolism uh, field, let's say, in the, the mid-2000s. Uh, Chris is a professor and director of industrial ecology program at the University of Victoria, and he has worked for over 20 years in uh, the fields of um, climate change, um, industrial ecology, accounting elements, and how to reduce the environmental impact of cities. Now he has developed a standard approach of citywide greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases accounting, um, developed mitigation strategies, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. What is very interesting is I think that he has um, academic background both well both not only from engineering but also from economics and management and I think this will also bring some interesting insights. Um, he has worked with uh, the World Bank, uh, with uh, NL Foundation, and many other uh, prestigious uh, foundations. So with all that being said, I'm extremely happy to have um, Chris Kennedy with us. Chris, welcome to the podcast. And could you please let us know who you are and what is your, your work? Like? <laughs> Aristide, I'm overwhelmed by your introduction. I don't think I need to say too much more about who I am, but uh, that's fabulous. Uh, I love the use, I love the way you use the word Renaissance because it it really was. I I was fortunate to sort of be at a be at the beginning of a, a restart of urban metabolism studies. After you know, Woolman had done it in the '65, and so there was and there was others between '65 and and when we started looking at Toronto's metabolism. But it was it was fortunate and timely when we started piecing together the, the data from those eight cities around the world, and uh, and also tried to put a definition on metabolism or urban metabolism, which was which was possibly why that paper gets cited so much because yeah, it's, it's got something there for people to say, <laughs> "What is this thing?" <laughs> yeah. So you define it as the sum of uh, the sum total of the technical and socioeconomic processes that occur in cities, resulting in growth, production of energy, and elimination of waste. Wow, that's a a difficult definition. Yeah. Yeah, and I, maybe I should say a little bit more about where that definition came from. And I, and I, uh, I basically looked up a, a dictionary. I think it was a Collins Dictionary definition of metabolism which sort of gave the common person's definition of metabolism as opposed to the this more technical biologist, anabolism, catabolism type of definition of metabolism. And I said, hey, you know, this applies to cities, but it's, it's about socio and technical processes. It's not just about biological and chemical processes. And so it, it, it really was an adap adaptation of, of that. Yeah, that's the, the root of the definition. So I don't, it, there's not a lot of genius in that. It's just uh, <laughs> practicality. <laughs> so, so I'm wondering, so you are a civil engineer. You also did economics. And as you said, there was, you know, in the accounting realm of, uh, of sustainability and cities, there was already a woman back in the 60s. And then there was this, phase in the 70s, let's say, where we had uh, Autumn, where we had Duvigneau in Brussels, where we had a couple of people. Uh, we had Hong Kong with Newcomb as well. So we had, I think, five cities that kind of did their homework quanti uh, quantitatively. And, uh, and there seemed to be a lot of um, emulation as well. I mean, they, they seemed to discuss with them between each other. So there was something happening and then it kind of died off. And then you brought it back up. Do you know what happened there during these 20 years or so before you started again? No, I never really pieced together how much those other authors knew each other. I mean, there was uh, Girardet, mm -hmm. I may be mispronouncing that. He, he was working not as an academic. He, he, he sort of, he wrote about metabolism of cities. Uh, 
I, I don't know to the extent to which those other four paper authors really knew each other. Maybe you've discovered things I don't know. But, uh, but what was striking about them was how, just how different they were. Yeah. I mean, one was a chemical engineer, one was a, was a geographer, a civil engineer. Even the way they drew their diagrams of metabolism were, were very, one was very organic and one like the Brussels metabolism was beautiful. I, I, I use that slide for years as a way of introducing the complexity, right? Whereas the chemical engineers, it was just a, a, a flow through reactor of Tokyo, <laughs> right? So, so no, I, I mean, and there were others as well. I mean, I discovered years later, like getting into some of, there was some work on Barcelona and I think it was maybe Prague or something like that, that was done mm -hmm. under some European studies, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily in mainstream literature. I mean, I was, I was fortunate when I was doing that review paper with, with, with Josh and John, the other two authors, the uh, University of Toronto, where I was at at that time, had a fabulous library. It was, it's the third largest library in North America. Uh, and I was able to find print copies of some of those uh, oh, wow. relative, relatively rare publications. And that's how I, I dug them out and pieced them together. And, and obviously the reading, what, the writing of Bruner and Bacini was also an influence because Paul Bruner had, had, he, he gave me some clues in some of his writings just where, where, to, where to go look for things, right? So I, I, it was a piecing together. But, uh, but yeah, and, and then, of course, putting everything into common units was, was important. And, of course, and, and, yeah. Uh, that was actually, if anything, the, the meat of the paper, really. So, yeah. But, but you did, bef before you, you, you worked a bit on infrastructures and tr transportation, if I remember correctly, before emerge i mean before going to this review but how did you say okay that's a that's something that i'm i, I might be interested to to look at this or why why what was so appealing that you you then you know spent 10 years almost uh working on the topic you know you i i thought you might ask me about why i why i sort of <laughs> started working on urban metabolism so i i, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and i <laughs> I mean, we could talk a long time about this. I'll, I'll be, and I think there's really three, there's really sort of three things, or actually three cities that influenced me. Like uh -huh. it was a, a London, Leipzig, and Toronto. And, and there's a story behind each of them, right? We, we can go into them if you want. But I mean, the first one is London. London's where I, you know, I did my undergraduate degree as an engineer, in civil engineer at Imperial College in London. And the, the, the fact that I even chose to go to London from, I was living in, you know, Lincolnshire in the English countryside. There, you know, I was obviously drawn to cities. I, there was something about the big city that fascinated me. I always and uh, and when I finished as a civil engineering degree, I decided I didn't want to be a civil engineer, <laughs> and I went and studied <laughs> economics after that. <laughs> why? Uh, what, what was the? What did you like, and why did you expect to find with economics? I think it was something about the. the the left brain and the right brain. I think mm. that the engineering is very focused, very, you know, it's, it's, it's really detailed. And, and I, to me, economics was an ability to sort of see the world in, in broader terms, but still using analytical skills, which is obviously where I guess my strengths lay at the time. So uh, yeah, that was, that was it. Although I guess ultimately I went back to engineering and, <laughs> and uh, you know, use my engineering degree to go to North America and, and do a PhD uh, at the University of Waterloo, so. But, so you uh, said London, you said? Yeah, yeah, London, then Leipzig. Leipzig was is a quirky one here. Many people probably don't know that I, I worked at the Umweltforschungszentrum in, in Leipzig. Uh, uh -huh. And that was after my PhD. I, I did my, my PhD in groundwater contamination and, and then went out to, to what was Eastern East Germany or Eastern Germany. It was mid nineties. So it wasn't so long after reunification. And I worked on on cleanup of environmental catastrophes, really, that that, that were in the former, you know, East Germany, and and I I, I love the city of Leipzig because I mean, it's got this is a city where Gödel and Escher and Bach, you know, <laughs> sorry, you know, sorry, not Escher, that's that's a book. Gödel and, and Bach were were uh, were uh, had visited, and, and it had a great rich culture. But what I really got out of it was that. I witnessed firsthand just hor how horrible man's treatment of the environment was, the environmental pollution that we had caused. It really, it was something that I, I really saw firsthand. Over there in uh, the city? 
Yeah, not so much in the city, but just in the, in the area around the city. It, it's in it's Leipzig is surrounded by the brown coal lands of of eastern Germany. So there's there's these large areas where they've just done strip surface mining uh, to to get down to the brown coal. And I you know I worked on one particular uh, site where they they'd yeah you know, there was a house in a little town called Seibling or something like that or, or a, a row of houses and, and across the road from them was this big pit. And, you know, the grandfather's generation would have seen this big pit created by the, the, the coal surface mining. And then the next generation, they, they took the, the brown coal and they, pro, they processed it to get these coal briquettes. And then they, they took the waste from that and put it back into the pit. So there was this big black lake of organic nastiness, right? And then after that, they, they, they finally it drained away or, and, and they turned it into a landfill, <laughs> So it was, you know, I just thought, oh, what a horrible, you know, what a horrible kind of existence of the Triple generations disaster, of people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just, and, and it's unnecessary, right, if we're clever and smart, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, emphasis so, on if, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that, like, that Leipzig itself, the city was, was fabulous. It was, it was very entrepreneurial, it was growing, it was really responding from the opening up to the West really well and had all this great culture to, to, to learn upon. So I loved Leipzig, but it was this surrounding area that I just like, <laughs> ooh. No. But that's what I was working on, right? That was my, my area at that time. And so groundwater pollution when you were looking at this was from, let's say, contamination. Was it from these, uh, from coal or was it from other elements? Uh, in this particular case, it was uh, pyrolysis wastewater, so it was from the manufacturing of coal briquettes. But there was there was lots of other examples of 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 waste sites uh, in in eastern Germany. They used to there was an area they called it the Black Triangle of Europe because it, it went into Poland and the Czech Republic as well. So, uh, and the Germans were were really it was great they were working at different ways of remediating these sites you know from forestry to creating natural lakes or and uh, other processes i i worked with a limnologist while i was out there which was really cool because that's quite a, a different discipline to mine so yeah so that, and, yeah and the third city well the third city was toronto right so i i returned back to canada after my after my stint in in germany and got the got a uh, job as a assistant professor at the university of toronto And there were several things about Toronto that, that really influenced the, this, this work on urban metabolism. One, one was, uh, I, I started reading the, the work of Jane Jacobs, uh, who you know, is very famous for her, several of her books on, on cities, including life and death of American cities. And I'm, I'm not sure everyone knows, but Jane Jacobs had been a, a New Yorker and she'd sort of written about amazing insights into, as to how cities economies work from a very much from a, a grounded social on the street eyes on the street perspective but she moved north to with her family to toronto and, and stopped some highways going into downtown toronto as part of you know, her work there so she was a she was an icon of toronto and i and toronto's a confident it's, a, it's sort of a, one of those wannabe city states you know it's it's the capital of ontario it's not the capital of canada but it's a wannabe city state so i i read jacob's work and it, it kind of i got i got an there's an urban vibe that toronto's got very strong uh that, that i really picked up and also you know i got this job as a, a faculty position and it was fairly open you know it was actually a call on something to do with sustainability which was you know there was some really well-minded professors at U, U of T as we used it and I'd gone in as a groundwater researcher uh, but within two years I decided you know what I I, I want to do something different and so I I uh I was quite brave you know in the middle of tenure track <laughs> I switched my disciplines <laughs> right I did a part-time MBA just to, to cover myself Oof, in case I, yeah. I didn't get tenure. And I had an old colleague called Rodney White who'd written a book on an urban environmental management. He was, in the, he was a geographer. And uh, I'd, got, uh, I'd, I'd seen in his book, there's a, a, a few attempts to sort of quantify energy use in Toronto. And, uh, and another colleague had, had actually given me a stash of papers on sustainability that he'd collected but he'd just gone off to become the chair of the department so he didn't have time to to do any work in the area and amongst it was the, the hong kong metabolism paper uh -huh. and I, i just i think i put two and two together i just thought you know what well there's 
someone's tried to look at the metabolism of Toronto and it, they've not really done it. And this is, it is and, and this is a framework that as an engineer, it's very quantitative. It's, an, it's a framework we could use as an engineer to, to, to take on this topic of urban sustainability. So that was really the, the, the genesis of, of that, right? And, you, and uh, you can also see the groundwater is, is an influence because in that Changing Metabolism of Cities paper, I, 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 I use groundwater as a way of talking about storage process, storage and flow processes, right? Which is uh, a little bit more in depth than the, the most urban metabolism <laughs> researchers would go into, right? So sorry if that's too long, but there, there's, no, there's no. a lot. You know. it, it, I'm always curious, so well, what's the story? Because there's no, of course, let's say curriculum on urban metabolism, or there's no single way to get inside of it. And I think uh, each one of us have a, a different entry path to, to the discipline. And, and it also explains why some people are more interested in some parts of the, of this field than, than, than another, let's say. But uh, yeah, yeah, when I discovered this topic, someone told me about this metaphor and because I, I wanted to do quantitative stuff for a city, but I didn't know what to do. And a friend of mine did LCA uh, of, uh, of buildings, I think. Uh, and I said, okay, let's do an LCA of a city. Well, how would that work? Uh, and I couldn't yeah. understand how to do it. And then someone talked to me and said, well, perhaps you're looking at urban metabolism. And well, you know, everything was uh, clear after that. You know, I, I just... right. <laughs> But of course, uh, I then discovered the uh, work from Matthew Gandhi and from urban political ecology. And then I said, ooh, wait. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's some good, that, I mean, very interesting work in, in, the, in the geography or literature, right? And even going back to Marx and the others who talked about metabolism. Yeah. Uh, so yeah it's, which it's, makes it's, it more, go on. so it makes it more interesting, right? It's, it's... Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not uh, something that... Uh, that I feel that we comprehend still. I mean, even if the, the principle is is easy, let's say, we still are, I guess, at the perhaps not at the genesis, but there are so many things to be done, at least in 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 its implement, not its implementation, because you know it's just a lens to look at cities, but at least at how to use it to to do stuff or to to use it for policy making. I, I feel we're still at the very beginning, but perhaps you have experienced this very much uh, over the last years. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes and no. I mean, uh, I just, I mean, just to pick up on one thing you said, you, you, you use the term metaphor and, and some of the early papers did use metabolism as a metaphor, but I, I learned from Maria Fischer-Kowalski that it's not a metaphor, right? You know, cities really do have energy and material flows through them. <laughs> but uh, the, the policy side for me, I, I, I think the importance of urban metabolism is that it's, uh, is its breadth. It, it, it gives you a broad view of, of the city. And uh, the real policy lesson for me or breakthrough for me was really when it came to the greenhouse gas accounting work. Mm. Because when I was writing the urban, doing the urban metabolism study of Toronto and, and, and doing the comparison of cities worldwide, at that point, the literature on urban greenhouse gas accounting was very weak. There was a few, I think there was there was pockets in different nations of people that that did that did it, and there was competing, similar but competing frameworks that were that were kind of they were they were hidden. They were really they were sort of businesses, and they weren't wanting to give their method away. And uh, so I I then moved on to do this this comparison of the greenhouse gas emissions of, of these cities, because, you know, as you well know, I you know, the greenhouse gas is, it's all about mul multiplying emissions factors by activity levels, right? And the, the activity levels are all in the metabolism, right? So the metabolism <laughs> provides all this data, which goes right into your greenhouse gas calculations, right? So, so I did this, uh, this work, comparing the greenhouse gas emissions of 10 global cities, largely was in industrial ecologists and people that you know quite well, you know, and I mean, they probably interviewed a few of them yeah. uh, on, on, your, on your part, right? But, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, at that time, I got to know this guy called Dan Hornbeck, who was, with the, who was the urban anchor at the World Bank. And he, you know, he's, and he was from Canada, so I met him in, in Toronto. And he, he said to me, no, the, the, the bank has been wanting this for five years, right? what you just <laughs> produced, because you've used a consistent methodology. It's, it's transparent. You've collected data from all the cities. You've given all your data sources. You've, 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 you've done a, a rigorous scientific approach to greenhouse gas accounting from cities. 
And we can use that. And I, I, and I tell you not, within a month of us publishing the, 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 the results paper in, in, in ESNT, the World Bank made a $75 million investment into Bangkok on the basis of they, <laughs> they had they had Bangkok was one of our 10 cities. And I, and I was like, and I didn't get a cent for this from the World <laughs> Bank, right? You know, course, I was yeah. like, but, but you know, I, I got it at that point. It was like, hey, we've arrived in the policy world. The World Bank built, built a, it, its financing mechanism for funding cities. I mean, they actually deal with countries, but they, but they, they built it on that, that accounting method, which, which basically came from the metabolism. And that was really the, you know, sort of the connecting of the dots from metabolism, which is kind of science through to the policy. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's a, the experience there. But what type of funding w would they then provide? Was it for infrastructure? Was it, what type of, yeah? Yeah, it was, they, so they had a larger package of funding for uh, for Thailand, I guess, and they they added an extra 75 million in. Uh, it was for funding uh, public transportation uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure. You know, I, I guess uh, the, the Thai government had said, you know, we we want to put this this transit in, and it will reduce as part of our strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the bank was able to say, hey, oh, hey, yeah, okay, we've 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 got a a measure of your emissions. We know how much you've got from transportation, and we the method is consistent with that that, that New York and London are using, right? So, or we know from New York and London. So, yeah, okay, we can go ahead and do that. You know, there's a, probably a, a bit more to it than that from, from a financial perspective. <laughs> sure. But anyway, you know, it was, that was my you know my 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 insight into it. Yeah, so. And it wasn't the last time you you compared cities, right? So you you compare them in the changing metabolism of cities. You compare them then for the greenhouse uh, gas emissions, uh, and then you also compared the the twenty seven mega cities in this uh, mega paper uh, that is well very condensed actually, but uh, it it probably took a lot a lot of time, and it was so I think it was in twenty fifteen. It was called uh, what was it the energy and material flows of the mega cities. And I think it was like a bomb. When, when you dropped it, it was, wow, 27 cities compared at the same time in terms of metabolic flows. That was, well, that was a lot. Uh, and we, I think most of the, the, the field was very excited to read it. So what happened there? Oh, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. That's a great way of describing it. It was, yeah, I mean, it was a, a fabulous journey. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, a Angelo and others at the, uh, Angelo Ficini of the Enel Foundation, right, uh, uh, were, were a big part of that. It was, it, it was, yeah, no, it was a fascinating project. Uh, there was the, the, the Enel, the Enel Foundation who, they didn't just sponsor the work, they were inherently involved in it, mm -hmm. uh, They, it was a new foundation created by it's Italy's national utility that, that's basically, basically a, a global renewable energy entity uh, today and, and back then. Uh, they actually reached out to me. I think they'd, they'd been speaking to some people in the industrial ecology network about they, were in, they were, had an interest in urban metabolism. They had an interest in, in megacities, in particular South, Afri South American megacities, uh, mm. which, which came out. And... Uh, They, they reached out to me. They said, hey, I'm, we're going to be in uh, North America next month. <laughs> Would you like to meet us? Would you like to meet us uh, in New York City, right? <laughs> so I, I, I'm in Toronto. So I, I did a short flight and we met for lunch on Fifth Avenue in New York, which was all kind of very kind of, you know, uh, enjoyable. It was just a lovely experience, right? And, and basically... Uh, the Enel Foundation said to me, "Hey, we, we want to study metabolism in megacities. Uh, would you would you like to propose something? You know, and <laughs> and uh, I you know, and I said to them, well, you know, how much do you want to spend? <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> what's and, the scope of the project? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was it was interesting because you know they, they, they said to me, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think, I'm, I've forgotten." someone's name that she's terrible but Angelo wasn't there at that, that meeting but uh, they, they, they said to me yeah maybe just study 10 cities you know and, and here's a couple we're interested in the South American ones so make sure you include them you know, that's because they, they Enel was 
was the electricity provider for some of the mega cities in, in South America. Plus, plus, plus cities that weren't quite mega cities yet. They were including Lima. And I was like, well, Lima's only 9 million. I'm sorry, that's not, <laughs> that's, that's out of bounds, right? And I convinced them, or I wrote a proposal to say, look, for us to, you know, if we study 10 mega cities, that's kind of interesting. But if we did all 27 mega cities, if we did all of them, then that's a landmark, that's a real piece of science, right? Because, you know, there's no kind of holes or gaps. It's, it's comprehensive and complete. So uh, I, I made a proposal to them to, to study all 27 mega cities. And uh, we devised a, you know, the challenge is the data, obviously. You know really well. <laughs> the data, you know. I mean, that's it's just doing 27 cities, but 27 mega cities where we're yeah. going beyond the central city into the suburbs. And, you know, some, some of the cities were like 20, 100 municipalities, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we, you know we're in there. Uh, and so we, but I'd learned enough that really the, 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 the trick is you, you need a person in every city or at least yeah. a person in every country, right? So, so we devised a, a mechanism whereby every, every we, we found a partner in every city, just about, uh, and that was really using the industrial ecology network. We used the World Bank network at that as well. And, and uh, I had a colleague, Patricia McCartney, who was running, running the Global Cities Institute in Toronto. Right? Uh, we used her network as well. So that, that was an effort just to get that network mm. of people together. And we, we offered honorariums, uh, I can't remember if it was $1,000 or a couple of thousand dollars. It was not a lot. It was an honorarium to say, hey, no, just you, you provide the data. We'll give you an honorarium. But you, you'll also, we want you to, to contribute to the paper. We want, we want your reflections on the data. We want you to, to give us insights. We want you to co-author. Not, not all the papers, but the, 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 P, the PNAS paper. Yeah. So, so uh, and, you know, amazingly it worked, right? I mean, I, I hired a postdoc, Ian Stewart, and... Uh, the, the project went twice as long as it was meant to go. <laughs> Not that we got twice as much funding, but it, it was, you know, it now had a, cha- had a reorganization of the foundation halfway through the project, <laughs> which we survived, <laughs> which was, which was, which was tricky. But uh, yeah, in the end of the day, it, it, uh, it produced this paper with some, some really neat insights into the working in mega cities, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And what was interesting is before, I don't know, I guess it was within this whole project, you had also this indicator set that you developed so that you could really compare, let's say the cities have comparable data with within uh, or, or comparing all of these cities. And of course, that's always the, the bane of the existence of urban metabolism studies. What do you account for and what do you exclude? You know what I mean? Because we could always include more and more and more or you know, what's, what's in and what's out in the quantifications. Um, and so what we also have uh, inherited uh, in, in metabolism of cities in our, in our global data sets and all of that is this layering system. I think that speaks a lot to have layers on explaining the context and then layers on the flows themselves and different layers. And as we see fit, we can add or subtract some layers. And so I think that this was perhaps even most interesting is how do, how do we build something that you know, all cities can be compared at the end of the day because just the flows is something, but then we also need, you know, how do you compare Tehran with Paris? How do you compare Buenos Aires with uh, uh, Bangkok? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very yeah. difficult to actually do that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those, the, those layering of those layers, actually, I think it was Angelo or, or Renata, that Renata mm-hmm. was a colleague at Enel Foundation who, who were really sort of keen on that, that layering approach. That we you know, and yeah, I think you've got it absolutely right. It, it's you know, there was certain data you really want to get. You want energy use if you can. I mean, that that's kind of natural. But some of the material flows are pretty difficult to get. And some of them are a bit quirky, right? Much uh, more difficult actually than energy and water, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was amazed. We didn't really make a lot of it, but we got uh, we we got some data on steel, which was okay. for about you know, if you got data for s- seven or eight cities. That would be enough. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it, it, it sort of made sense that the, 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 the cities that were growing fastest, not necessarily the largest mega cities, but the ones that were doing lots of construction, you know, you could see some correlation with steel. Uh, 
we also tried to get data on food and it and it really you know it was really completely inadequate we didn't i don't think we ended up reporting it in the paper at all but you know i was i, I just I, I just remember sort of i think it was cairo we got sort of like someone reported the numbers of tins of, of, of hot chocolate or something like that it was really you know it was really quirky and i was like yeah i'm not sure that we can you know do much with that but you know that others have gone on to do really good work on food but we really didn't we didn't get it at all you know in our data set and that was okay right so and what do you i mean because you've compared so many times different cities what what how do you approach this very extremely difficult task to compare cities and to what insights do we bring out of it and how can we really compare cities? Uh, I, I was say, well, yeah, no, I, I actually, I was sort of, I was, I wanted to twist the question a little <laughs> bit. I mean, let me, let me say something that's kind of a response, but isn't exactly a response. <laughs> I think what I love about doing it is you actually learn something about the city, mm. right? You know, you, you can read about the history of a city and I've, I've written, books on the evolution of cities right which is which is another topic but we have it here yes I, I oh, have some questions okay. later on, yeah. <laughs> sure but 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 you it's like you know you know as an economist you, you you can find out about the gdp of a city or you can look at a map of geography you can look at the map of the city and you sort of know where the the main subway stations are or, you know the main squares are you you learn the architecture of the city and you know, when you study the metabolism of the city, you learn something else, right? You you complete that picture. You add the, you add the physiology to the morphology, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what what you do. And you think you, you look at a place and go, yeah, it makes sense that this place has all this energy use. Look how spread out it is. Look how big the buildings are, you know, uh, or look how cold it is here, you know. So you you, you, you it adds something to sort of the understanding, uh, the understanding of a city that. Uh, that could be amazingly lost. I, I mean, I remember if we if we go back to the the greenhouse gas paper, uh, one of our one of our ten cities was Denver. You know, Anu Ramaswamy, of course, who you I'm sure you know well. Uh, she was based in Denver at that time, and she and one of her grad students were, were the the co-authors of the paper. And Denver is a little bit I don't say off the map, but it's an, it's a North Amer a, a relatively bad North American city in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I just remember going, I, I, you know, I did a number of radio interviews around that paper. And, and one of them was a, you know, a, a radio station in, in Denver itself, right? <laughs> and I just remember the presenter introducing me and saying, you know, we, the people of Denver, think we're living in the greenest city in the world, right? Because <laughs> we have these beautiful Rocky Mountains behind us and it's, and it's clean living. And it's, you know, and I had to explain to him, but, you know, you, you use a... It, it, you've got an interior continental climate, so you, you've got you know you a lot of energy for for heating and cooling, and you, you're running off coal power. Right? <laughs> that and doesn't help. Yeah, doesn't help though. No. And you've got this really spread out, you know, typical North American sprawl. Right, so you, you're driving an, an awful lot. Right, so it's your your heating, your high carbon electricity, and your and your, and your transportation emissions. Which are the big three, right? Yeah. You know, that's Whatever why you're you over. Mean, yeah. yeah, that's why you're over twenty tons per capita. That's why. You know, and they just, and it was like, you know, like huh? You know, it was like it was news to them. It was you don't perceive that, right? And until you've sort of studied the, the metabolisms of the city. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but it was kind of where it, you know kind of where it, it took me, I suppose. No, you're right. I think it always goes back to some similar insights. Let's say. Uh, each city, their main flows are energy, water, construction materials, and food, let's say. Uh, of course, water dwarfs them all in terms of mass. Um, and, you know, on the output side, it's more or less the same thing. So we, we have, I think, now some generalizable insights, uh, which, which are good, because at least, you know, when we start a new urban metabolism study, it's not from scratch. We already have... Uh, some habits and some, uh, you know, insights that are comparable from one city to another. Of course, then there is some specificities. And this is why we were also very attached to, to context specific elements is, you know, how do we start then doing policies which are perhaps not exportable and are very context specific? Or is there something that, uh, you know, is there any, are all policies universal or should we ground them all and how do we start grounding them? And I think that's the next level 
which we're right now in or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, that, that provokes a couple of, you know, responses to me. Just first one, again, in going back to the Megacities paper, I remember when we were collecting the data for Karachi hmm. uh, in, in Pakistan, how, you know, a, a big part of Ian Stewart's work was actually proofing the data and checking it was right. I mean, I remember the electricity use for Karachi was coming out way, way much bigger. I mean, it was like we had Delhi and Mumbai. <laughs> And then, I like, and then Karachi was like way, way bigger. I was like, no, that just can't make sense, right? No, let, let's double check that number. And so, you know, we went back and you know, it turned out they'd given us the electricity use for the whole of Pakistan. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> right. It's like, no, we, right. we spotted that one because, you know, we'd expect it to be a, similar to those other types of cities. Like, you know, the difference would be interesting, but, you know, but we, we knew that those South Asian uh, cities or have really low metabolisms, right? Mm. Per capita in per capita terms, right? So we'd learned uh, we'd learned something there. Uh, I can't remember what my second point was going to be. <laughs> <but> anyway, <laughs> that was no, no. We're about talking policy. about the, yeah, exactly about universality or context specificity. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe this is moving on to some some of the the last work that I've mm. more later work I've done on, on cities. Uh, where it's it's not really doing full metabolism studies, but but just sort of drawing upon the learnings of, of 20 years working on cities. Uh, we did some work for the World Resources Institute on uh, called shifting currents. It was about electrification of cities, and, and that's you know that's a big topic on you know, big strategy for dealing with uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And we were able to look at you know the whole planet of cities and say, you know, electrification is a, a major strategy, but it, it doesn't necessarily apply everywhere. And, you know, what are the, the two key variables that we should look for in understanding which cities are really good places to electrify? And, it, you know, and one is the carbon intensity of, of electricity, which, you know, we, we use a lot in the greenhouse gas accounting, which is something, it's an addition to the metabolism, but it's an important part of the impact of the metabolism. And the other is just to what extent is this city using electricity? What percentage of the population actually have access to electricity? Because when you're looking in the global south, it's, you, know, you can't sort of start professing that everyone should drive electric cars if only 10% of the population actually have electricity, right? It doesn't, it's just, it's social equity grounds. It just doesn't make sense. So, but we were able to, to pick out a whole number of cities across the, the world and in different countries where actually electrification was a, a really good strategy for for reducing emissions or or growing without so much large emissions, uh, so that that was a I think that would be an example of of of, a, of something that's useful for policy people in 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 a, in a very simple you know two very simple measures nicely displayed on a map of the world with some tables in the back uh, which really came out of the understanding of metabolism you mm -hmm. know I think yeah I remember I think it was a. Uh perhaps in 2017 or in one of the conferences, you said the future of cities is electric cities or the future is electric cities, something like that was the, the title of your presentation, I think. Uh, and you had like a nice uh, futuristic uh, diagram, I think, uh, of or neon signs. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I think Actually, I think there's a rock band called Electric City, and I think okay. I stole their, I think I stole their, their, their logo or something. Might be that. I'll go have a listen. Yeah. But and how do we get to electric cities? Is it the so we electrify all of the appliances, I guess, and electrifying all of the needs of en of uh, of energy into electricity? That's the the main. Uh, or is there something else that I can think of? Yeah, and you, you, you're you're on the right the right track. I mean, there's there's a the the, the main ones are electrification of the of the vehicles, hmm. which is which is here today with automobiles. Obviously, it's a bit harder for for freight and larger, you know, larger trucks. Uh, but then also the building stock. The you know, in the last ten years, air source heat pump technology has really progressed. You know, ten years ago, ground source heat pumps. You know what people would talk about, and there, there's always challenges with the unknown geology and you know going underground. But the the you know the uptake in air source heat pumps means that the electrifying buildings is is a is a major strategy that is and, and can be pursued, right? Or can and is pursued. 
what, it, what I find interesting about that is, though, is, and again, this comes out of, I did some work with David Bristow in his PhD thesis on, on resilience of cities. Hmm. And we quantified energy stored in cities uh, yeah. as a measure of resilience, right? So it's a slightly different uh, angle, but it's, it actually is, it has some really important insights for, for the, the, the strategy of electrification. The challenge is if you, if you, if you electrify your city, then you're, you're going from, uh, you know, most Western cities have maybe five or six predominant forms of energy, you know, your, your diesel, your gasoline, your natural gas, a little bit of coal where it's still used, wood a little bit, you know, and electricity, right? If you go from six down to, you know, to just one, then you're, you're, you're much more vulnerable to shocks, right? You, you're totally dependent, you've drastically reduced resilience. So it's important to when, when talking about electrification of cities to also think about local generation, building scale generation versus the, the larger scale, you know, external wind and solar plants. And, and uh, as you know, the, the nature of cities is such that you can't generate all the electricity you need off your roofs because, you know, unless they're really spread out, but then if they're spread out, they need more electricity. So, uh, so I, I do think there's there's some there's some important subtleties in, in how you go about that. And I don't I think I don't think that's been necessarily well well written on or or I don't think I don't see it getting into into policy very much. I don't think that the utilities or the the people who govern utilities have really caught on to that uh, yet, and they need to. That's really important. Yeah, you're right because I've never thought of this of you know homogenizing or going to one vector of energy is actually a risk, of course, uh, of resilience. And of course, seeing how the grid today is vulnerable and we're all freaking out with blackouts, how this risk gonna increase in the future. So it's a, it must be quite daunting uh, for, for grid operators, this type of uh, electrification of cities. Yeah, no, actually, and again, going back to the, to the, uh, the sort of the, the comparisons between cities. It's interesting, actually. I, I, I always remember looking at Bangkok's uh, energy sources, and it was much more diverse than any of the Western cities. They had they were burning rice husks and all sorts of stuff, you know. To, to you know, and in, in a sense, uh, as they become more developed, they actually become less less resilient uh, in, in some in some respects. I mean, it's, it's there's a bit more to it than that, right? But it's. Uh, uh, so yeah, no, I, I think it's a an angle that I, I'd, I'd like to see m more work on. I'd like, mm. yeah. So uh, we you you mentioned briefly the your book, um, the evolution of uh, great world cities, um, which you kind of wove through how big cities happened and how they made wealth back in the day and how the 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 old cities are that were wealthy are not the new cities that are wealthy and how this wealth moved around i, I guess of course when we translate uh, you know wealth into flows of course there is or you know wealth is or there is capital and then there is money flow so of course there the, it's very uh, metabol metabolic as well uh, so i'm wondering how why did you, was that the, the culmination of, you know, engineering and uh, economy that's brought you to write this book or, or what did you have uh, uh, w before, before writing this book? What was the, the rationale that you had in mind? <laughs> it's, actually, it's funny you should ask that. Uh, I was reflecting on that, not so much because of the podcast, but I'm, I'm uh, doing a book review of some of uh, a latest book by John Ehrenfeld, who's, huh? you, know, a, 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 you know, such a, an amazing leader of the, the field of industrial ecology going way back. You know, he's the founding executive director and his academic work is fabulous. And, and John had, John, had, uh, John was uh, helping me arrange the 2007 ISIE conference in Toronto. He was one of the four of us, he, and very much the, the steering hand. And I learned a lot from him. And, he, and he, it was him that really got me interested in complexity uh, and, and was big on looking at complexity uh, in industrial ecology. And in some respects, it's only the, the second last chapter where I look at cities as ecosystems and I bring in a bit of the complexity theory where, where John's influence comes in. 
that 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 book evolution of great wealth cities really relates to my work on metabolism of cities and industrial ecology but the rest of it is really a, a, another me it's it's yeah. that it's that guy that didn't want to study civil engineering and went off and studied economics uh and uh yeah but there is a weird i mean there's a weird story to it too because i you know after i finished my first seven years as the as an assistant prof or i guess the six and then i got i got my tenure at university of toronto i uh I went off on my sabbatical year, and I, I went to I went to Switzerland, which is where 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 you are now, right? <laughs> but uh, actually, I went to Oxford first. I had six months in Oxford in the geography in the geography department, uh, and then I did six months. Well, actually, it turned out to be four uh, because my my son was born, so I had to go. <laughs> but complexities here. But anyway, I, I reached out to Peter Bacchini, who of course was just a fabulous writer. All the all the things he was doing. And um, and it was it was odd because he just he just finished his professorship and he was working for the Swiss Science Foundation. Or, or I'm, I'm probably not got the correct term there, but he said you should come anyway and you can you can mix in with my old group. So I, I you know I still went and I and so uh, and I, I and on my sabbatical I'd written to, that I was going to take. I, I used to teach a course called Infrastructure Economics. It was a graduate level course, uh, and I was going to to write a book on infrastructure economics uh, and you know the infrastructure economics had sort of all the economics and an engineer needs to know not just the microeconomic stuff of the cost benefit but but to understand economics in its broader context the macro and those kind of things and you know after one month of trying to write this book i said this is boring <laughs> So I want to write something on cities instead. And so I started, you know, at some point there was some ideas came together that, you know, oh, I, I, it'd be way more fascinating to talk about the economies of cities at these different levels from micro to macro rather than just infrastructure for, for, for engineers, right? So that, that's probably the genesis of it. And I, so I just started writing a different book and it, it took me another five years, I said. <laughs> 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 but but uh, it was it was it was an adventure. I mean, it was it was quite a you know, a, a mission. And I, I mean, I did the the foolish thing, which was I I, I wrote a book before I had a publisher, you know. And then, yeah. uh, but then uh, you know, I got to know Richard Florida when he came to, to U of T, and he 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 read it and he loved it, and so he really went out, you know, encouraged U of T Press to publish it. So yeah, no, it's a. Uh, uh, <laughs> It's a big second matter uh, having uh, Richard Florida as well pushing your book. So, yeah, no, Rich, Richard was was great. Yeah, no, he was a, he was a really good colleague at U, at U of T. It was a shame to leave the. There were some great colleagues in, in in doing work on cities at University of Toronto. It was the right place for that type of work. It's not Victoria is a very different type of city, so it's, I don't quite have that same kind of uh, group of people around me here. But uh, that's perhaps so. Now you you work on biophysical economics perhaps so victoria has something to do with the, the biophysical element of uh, of this uh maybe uh <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice theory but no i mean that's i mean my main really the last five years at, at, in victoria have, have been about building this this green civil engineering department so i've been hiring professors i've hired a dozen people uh oh, yeah it's you know That, that's a lot of work yeah. and, and just building a department but the biophysical economics actually uh is has come out of something else i mean i've i've you know I, i've long for a long time i've read broadly across industrial ecology and, and economics uh, ecological economics and, and and other you know other similar types of fields uh and uh I actually, I mean, I don't know how long, it's, just, it's a little bit off away from the topic of city, so we can do this maybe concisely, but uh, I actually started writing another book, okay, again, <laughs> without a publisher, and, I, and I'm actually stuck, I've got, I've got this other book that's been written, uh, which is all about Malthusian struggle, it's very big picture, it's sort of a 250 year look at, at, at sort of, of not just the population problem, but the, the, the whole get package of environmental challenges that the globe fa faces right and in this book I, you know I, i go into the roots of industrial ecology and i go and explore the roots of ecological economics you know including you know a whole chapter on on the roots of thermodynamics so I, it's roots of roots of roots right and and one thing that i you know in, in that process you know i went back and i, I read a lot of original Uh, writing. So I read Georgesco Rojan's work. I read Daily Steady State Economics. I read, you know, and similar types of books. And I, so I really, 
And it, it just kind of occurred to me that, that Georgescu Rodin had this whole thing about the entropy law and the second law of thermodynamics that, that, that was kind of what all the ecological economists and, and some industrial ecologists to, to extent, you know, sort of go back and draw upon. And I thought, you know, there's a bit of a red herring because it just confuses everybody. Right? And really, you should just stick to the first law and think about, you know, energy flows. There's a connection back to metabolism of cities there. And I, I, I think I saw a different way of interpreting what Georgescu Rajan was trying to say. He was just trying to say economies are subject to the laws of physics. That, I think that's what he's just he's trying to say. And and of course, I also all this stuff on degrowth and steady state economies. And I just thought, uh, and, and Hall's work on biophysical, well, he called it biophysical economics. He's really looking at energy return and energy investment. What Basically what I did was I, I've come up with a method for replacing uh, general equilibrium models of, of, of neoclassical economics, using an equilibrium between capital, labor, and energy, right? So I've 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 got working on this method, and I'm a I applied it to to the industrial revolution as a way of developing it, uh, and now I'm applying it to 20th and 21st century uh, uh, North American economies, uh, really as a as a way of dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. So I got pretty excited by it, and it's 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 pretty much my main thrust of my work, <laughs> at least you know just now. Things change, but, but just now it's 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 really where I'm at. So, uh, so so this model could, could you elaborate a bit? How how does the how does it work? I, I'm not so I get the I'm a bit aware of CGE and in general how they work, but now you have uh, so capital stocks and then energy flows that you combine the three together to kind of see how they uh what was the outputs attached to to these three or yeah let me let me uh yeah let me elaborate a little bit more on that for sure i'd, I'd love to uh so the the, the the cge models basically uh this is going back to walrus and the idea that e e economies can be described by this general equilibrium where prices and, and outputs you know The, the, the balance of supply and demand for multiple products in all markets all can sort of come into this great big general equilibrium. And it, and it really has no physicality to it at all. It, it's very much, it's a social science model derived from physics, right? <laughs> but, but, no, but without using physics, if you use the mass of the physics, right? And, and various people have, have actually built CGE models of the industrial revolution, which was, I, I chose as my target period or era because it's a relatively simple economy uh there's a bit of data and it's not too contentious either you know there's, there's not a lot of people working in the space it's it's an easy space to develop new ideas i i think anyway I, i've got some interest in that area but but you know you, you come across these people who have written these these have come up with these general equilibrium models and one, one of them in particular was a, a researcher at university of chicago and what she had done is she'd put energy into the model But energy and, uh, was just a, a, an intermediate variable. You know, energy, the, the, the energy was just something that was used in industry and, and, the, and, and energy was dependent on capital and labor to generate the energy. And that's, and there's more to energy than that. Energy flows through the entire economy. You, you need energy to produce capital. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's there's a, there's yeah. a two way interaction. There's a feedback there. loop in there, yeah. Yeah. And so I'd, I'd said, well, and I'd rest, I mean, and Bob Ayers has written a lot on. You know, Bob Ez has got some great work on, on the role of energy and in, in putting it into neoclassical production functions. But, but I went further than that. I actually, I wrestled with the neoclassical production functions for the Industrial Revolution and they, they, they don't work. And, I, and I, I was reading this guy, Alan, who's a great scholar of that. He, he found the same thing, right? They don't work for the Industrial Revolution. So I kind of had to throw them away. So then, so then here's the story of how capital, labor, and energy come together in the industrial revolution and actually cities comes into this as well which is kind of neat so, so we can tie it back to the pod <laughs> without getting too much of a detour right so uh what happened in the industrial revolution is you've got these great increases in agricultural productivity so I'm, i'm looking at you know great britain from 1760 actually up to 1913 so i'm going up to first world war so it's, it's actually two periods of the industrial revolution you've got an increase in the in the productivity of agriculture which frees up labor you've got you've got more people than you need to, to produce your food right so you've got this labor and the labor i i had a simple sort of four sector model 
of the of the British economy. One sector is agriculture, which I just described the key thing of. The other uh, sectors are coal mining, and then there's a sector for construction and materials, or it's construction, but it's got materials layered into it. And then the the, the fourth sector is, is production of goods and services, which is obviously a very big sector, right? But it's a, sort of the last uh, down the line, right? And, and textile and, would go there, I guess, right? Because there was a lot of yeah. Yeah, so the textiles are, are, are under the goods and services, yeah. So I don't really focus on, obviously, you know, textiles, the cotton mills was a big part of the Industrial Revolution, but I'm, I'm more interested in those, the, 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 energy, mm -hmm. the energy side of it, right? Uh, and, and, and so the idea is that you've got this excess labor and they could go and work in any one of those other three sectors, but you can't, they can't get a job until there's capital infrastructure in place you know there has to be mines for them to go do the coal mining or, you know and there has to be factories or, or shops for the for the goods and services so so you you need to build the capital and obviously the construction and material sector is the sector that that does all the capital construction and there's, there's no it in those days right so it's 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 all it's all structural and mechanical engineering basically uh but then to to build capital assets you need energy so you you need the coal miners right so you've what you end up is is this this neat little equilibrium model where your your labor from your agriculture your, your energy from coal mines and your capital that's produced the physical capital produced from <coughs> excuse me your, your construction and material sector all kind of play out and you actually grow you grow your cities, mm -hmm. you grow your infrastructure, you grow your goods and services capital, right? So that, that's, I mean, the math is actually really, really simple. It's, it's, it's almost embarrassingly simple, but, it, but, it, but conceptually, it's a very different way of looking at uh, how economies function. And I, you know, and I've since, I'm, I'm in the beginnings of applying it now to the more complex uh, economies of today, which is, gonna, which is an, interesting, an interesting direction that I'm, I'm headed just now. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because as you, as soon as you said that uh, in the agricultural sector we had surplus, and thanks to that we could do all of the other things. That's how cities were born. I mean, we 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 need the surplus from somewhere else to to have cities, right? I mean, that's the kind of the the social and spatial uh, surplus that we need to to make cities. They they don't exist elsewhere. So I'm curious to to see how that would fit in as well like we need extra space outside to to make cities happen and then to make cities we need you know more material so yeah i'm i'm curious to see how that would evolve yeah i mean that's the i mean just a, tying a few, a few things together there that's uh you know this, this the, the the amazing thing about cities we were talking about complex systems mm. before and, and john Ehrenfeld's influence and and yeah cities are this things that emerge it's emergence right they they they, they the complex systems that emerge we free up the labor people need jobs and and cities are actually a a creation of higher order structures there are there are this complexity and and with with creating complexity there's this roles of people there's people to fix potholes there's people to to work in gas stations there's people to build buildings there's people to fix buildings you know there's uh And that, that all comes about, and you need an energy supply to do that too, right? So it's the combination of the, the labor, that, the excess labor from the countryside, the ability to, 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 have, to access energy sources that creates these amazing entities, these cities that, we, that many of us, or more than half of us these days live in. And, uh, and I, 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 again, just a connection to this was... Uh, I was really fortunate to supervise a PhD thesis of David Bristow, who, who again is another industrial ecologist, and and he he did his PhD on sort of the thermodynamics of cities, and and he was so far ahead of me. I, I didn't understand what he was doing. I came out of his first defense. I worked closely with him, but I came out of his first defense, and I said, "Oh, Dave, I finally got. I finally understand what you're doing." <laughs> you know, and he, he he had seen this idea of the, of the role of energy in the emergence of cities. It was in his. It was in his thinking. He needed a little bit of help to kind of to pull it out, right? But I, I find the penny dropped for me at, at, at what he was getting at, right? And so it's it's all buried in his in his PhD thesis. But, uh, so that was something that I, I really felt like I was learning about cities through, through that work and that perspective. But again, metabolism is is in there, right? It's 
yeah, the role of energy is it really critical? Yeah. Uh, so you you have these two current projects, biophysical economics and global infrastructure. What what is kind of your small uh, secret project that you're working now for 2021, 2022? Is there something that you really want to explore? Something that uh, you want to 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 discover still? Uh, something new that you want to embark on? Well, on on, on the cities line, the the. I did a recent conference paper looking at this question of jurisdictional responsibility for electricity supply, uh, tied into the question of resilience. Uh, I was looking at British Columbian cities and just pointing out that, you know, it, it, we really need the building codes to have, you know, PV on the roof of every building, I think. But the building codes don't say that. Building codes don't touch electricity supply or storage, which is important too, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the rules governing municipalities. Uh, so to say that there's lots of things pointing to the fact that municipalities have a responsibility for the well-being of people and you know provision of, of infrastructure and, and, and almost words like resilience, but they're superseded by the utilities, the electrical utilities, right? The electrical utilities have this power to sort of put their put their poles and their lines wherever they want, or or or, or you know sort of tell you municipalities that who's in control right and so there's i think there's some tensions to be worked out there you know, i'd love to see some more work done in there i'm not sure i will do it but I, it is something that about cities that, that's interested me a lot uh i, I i'm mainly working i'm, I'm mainly working on uh, a biophysical economics model of the united states just now uh oh, with, a, cool. with an old colleague from wri that's that's uh one thing i've actually got a, a new postdoc starting with me today which is really exciting because we're gonna you know he's gonna do some of that work but he's also just come out of a phd with peter victor in ecological economics so he's got some he's got some really great talent so i'm looking forward to to seeing what he produces uh and then again i've got this this other book that i've been beavering <laughs> away on so we'll see whether i find a publisher for that i don't know whether that that might be it might still be a few years away before that that sees the light of day is the topic also something in between civil engineering and economics, or no? This is the one on on the Malthusian struggle. Ah, it's, yeah, yeah. Sorry. You yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, no, it's got it's it's uh, it's actually way too ambitious. It's <laughs> that's that's a problem. Isn't it? Yeah. So, but, but you know, I mean, you need something ambitious to get excited to write it, and then when it's too ambitious, it's difficult, I guess, to to see where it ends. Or yeah, and actually, that's. There's, there's something about what you just said, which is sort of my almost like my learning in life, my learning as an academic that uh, I found myself about 20 years ago when I was transitioning from groundwater into sustainable cities that I was I was looking at the advection dispersion equation, which des describes solute transport. Right. And I was looking at, at the re uh, uh, its inability to, to, to describe tail effects. So I was looking at a tertiary phenomena. <laughs> you know, it was like one is this pollution, two that it, it it goes along and it spreads out, and three I'm looking at a deviation in how it spreads. And it and it was like maybe this is just like way way too fine a detail. And, and my world almost turned upside down. And I and I started working towards larger and larger scale and larger phenomena. And this is the whole realm of interdisciplinary research. And, and what you discover when you start saying was, well, how does this whole realm of ecology relate to economics or you know, physics or whatever it is? And you, you find these, these chasms <laughs> where, there's, there's, where there's, there's so much to learn, right? And there's so much, it's such an exciting space to, 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 to throw yourself into and, and work out connections between things. It's not reductionist science. It's, uh, it's something else. Uh, but it, it, it's fabulous for learning about the way the world works, I think. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we have, we, we generally have a last question, which is we want to recommend other people to, to well, we, we want you to share something uh, you would recommend other people to read or to watch or to listen to. Uh, probably in your, in your work of writing this new book, you probably have encountered many interesting readings. So do you have anything that's, really kind of sh shook you and you want to share that uh, share that with everyone oh oh yeah there's a, there's a lot in that <laughs> in that in that book 
Well, I'm, I'm going to re reiterate something I, I just said, actually, because it's, it's very much top of mind just now, but it, it also is, is, is very impressive. And, and, it, and readers, listeners or readers can't actually read it yet. But again, John Ehrenfeld's new book on flourishing, he's, he's got one already out on flourishing, so maybe his old book on flourishing they should go to, but he's got a new book coming out. Uh, it's, you know, I'm looking at the, 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 the pre-proof, the, the proof copy just now to, to, to write my review of it, but it, it, it is a, an amazing piece of work. I mean, it's got brain, brain uh, science and, and philosophy and sociology and business and, in, and ecology and spirituality wrapped into it. It, it is a really clever, sophisticated, deep look at, at, at humanity and our, and our challenges, right? So I, 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 I I'm in awe of John Aaron just now. So that, that's a pretty good plug for his, for his book, uh, you know, uh, on flourishing. Uh, I'm not sure I can top that. With, yeah. with, uh, with, uh, with, with this level of ambition, yeah, I can imagine it's difficult to, to top that. Yeah, yeah, no, it, 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 it's a fabulous. I mean, yeah, in, in, in terms of... Uh, the stuff I've been I've been writing on in my other book. No, I mean there's there's so much there's, it covers so much ground. I mean, uh, it's been interesting to sort of look at the history of of discovery of of global warming by you know the the challenge of of uh, di diversity biological diversity globally is, is something that I, I worry a lot about. And there's a new Tasgupta report which maybe people should look at if they if they haven't. Uh, I think that's worth looking at. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, see, I, you know, some of the foundational stuff on on uh, thermodynamics still interests interests me a lot. I, uh, I'm just trying to remember the name. There's a there's a researcher who moved from uh, moved back to Germany from from Maryland, whose work is Clyden Axel Clyden. Yeah, so Axel Clyden, uh, he he's uh, I think he's a J Jena. In, in East Germany now, uh, but he's done these wonderful work papers on understanding the, the whole Earth system through non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Not 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 too deeply technical or not too deeply mathematical, I should say. He's, his writing is, is really good. There's, there's there's several papers in in pretty pretty prestigious journals that I, I came across in the last few years. Uh, David Tillman's work actually that I mean he 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 did a he gave a presentation at a Gordon conference not too far away from you, probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. But his his work on understanding the future challenges of biodiversity loss to provide food for a growing and, and, and more affluent population is really quite hard hitting. And, and I, I, I do think it's uh, almost scary. But I, I think he, he's, and he's a very accomplished academic, too. So there, there's just a couple of of, of names I, I, I could I could throw out, but yeah, uh, I, that's probably enough to whet the appetite of listeners to this. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be covered for for a couple of months, I think, with a with yeah. these uh, list of because you need to digest them as well. It's not just uh, reading them; you also think there is knowledge to to be understood and then linked uh, with uh, each other. So, um, so. Thanks so much, Chris. I think we we covered many things. I, I learned a lot from, you know, the, the this Renaissance. I learned a lot from, uh, you know, what are some uh, interesting topics to also start researching again. Uh, some others to to rediscover as well. Um, thanks so much for taking your time, uh, Chris. And I think we I hope we're going to meet very soon in another conference and discuss this over. I am I'm really looking forward to reconnecting with people again. <laughs> I've had my jabs. <laughs> it's been fabulous to talk to you, Aristide. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And 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 kudos to you for doing this part. It's it's great. And you know, uh, I hope you you can edit that down and, and have a <laughs> a really good, some good insight from our conversation. So thank you. I, I always enjoy it. Thanks a lot for for sharing all of these insights. And thanks everyone for listening until the end. We'll see you at the next episode. Cheers.